Well, good morning. It is good to be together. Thank you for just being present to worship together. And, and I want to invite you to turn to Romans chapter 13. Romans chapter 13 in your Bibles. Um, if you don't have your Bible with you or you can't find it, don't worry. Uh, we'll have the scripture up on the overhead screen. But it is a, a special today, day today, and it wouldn't be this day if we didn't do this. Maybe. Ladies, do you enjoy receiving candles as gifts? Well, then think how much you'll enjoy giving them to that certain man in your life. Mandels has candles for all types of manly men. Are you looking for that ultimate gift, something that just says, Dad? Try grilling out, campfire, or A1 steak sauce. Is he having the guys over for the big game, but the home smells too much like a woman? Don't worry. Light up one of our sport-themed mandals. Pigskin, new baseball glove, bowling alley, musty locker room. Don't know what to get the man who is admired for his manliness by other manly men? Never fear. The Chuck Norris sweat mandal is here. Men, it's time to say goodbye to the likes of Golden Spice Pear and Seaside Holiday. And say hello to Urinal Deodorizer, Bait Shop, Red Meat, Wet Dog, Bacon Jalapeno Cheeseburger, Fear, Hardware Store, Charcoal, Peel Out, Mud, Fried Chicken, Leather, Burrito Fart. Mandels are scientifically engineered in our German laboratories by our professors of manology. Mandels are certified all natural, 1% wax and 99% testosterone. This offer is not valid in stores, so call now. Here's how to order. Call 1-800-MANDELS. That's 1-800-626-3537. Mandels, makers of manly man candles since 1907. Don't delay. Call now. That's 1-800-M-A-N-D-L-E-S. It never gets old. We've been doing this for, I don't know, like 16 years, and we're still showing that video every Sunday. So happy Father's Day. It wouldn't be Father's Day if we weren't giving out gifts. So we have gifts for you, dads. Uh, Forrest, can you help? Forrest, uh, if you didn't know, uh, <laughs> celebrating Father's Day as a soon-to-be, well, your dad, right? If you didn't know, now you know. So uh, we get some more help. Uh, Micah, can you help? So we have uh, some self-serving gifts. They say Melbourne French Church on it, and uh, that way you remember where you got it from. And <laughs> but yeah, it is. Uh, we're, we are in Romans 13 and 14, and uh, it is Happy Father's Day. So uh, we're grateful for all you dads. Um, it's important. You know, we prayed years and years ago that, that we would, uh, when I first got here, uh, after, after about a year, we only had about four or five men in worship. And uh, we had a prayer team, and, and one of the main prayers we had with that was that men would, would join their families, and men would lead their families to church and worship. And uh, we began to see that fulfilled over and over again over the years. And um, today I know many of our dads are out celebrating whatever they do on Father's Day, but uh, we're grateful for all you guys and, and the fact that you don't just uh, hope your kids grow up knowing the Lord, but that you actually lead by example by bringing them and worshiping with them. So yeah, here we are. If there's one thing I know about dads, it's that they like uh, all the, all the manlers we just taught. The other thing I know about dads is they love sermons. And, and, and so we're going to have three sermons today. You know, we look at Romans 13 and 14. As we get towards the end, we've been in Romans for a long time, almost a year. And as we get to the end of it, we see it begin to tidy things up. And it begins to recap some things. And so as I was looking at it and praying over it this week, there were three different messages kept coming. And, and I kept saying, well, which, which one is it, Lord? And, and it was all three. So three sermons. We're going to try to do it in 30 minutes because I know dads love sermons, but I know they love them short and to the point. Amen. Yeah, thank you, Greg. I was waiting for that. Thank you. you everybody else wanted to say it, but they didn't know if they had permission. To. All right. So are you ready? Are you ready? So we're looking at Romans 13 and 14. And as we do, we're, we're wrapping this part up. But it says some really, really important things. And, and the first sermon is simply this. And, and each sermon has, is a three-word title, which I never do. But we're doing it today because if I know anything about dads, they love short sermons with three-word titles. I made that part up. All right. So this one is any day now. Any day now. And we asked this question last week. If you knew Jesus was going to return one week from today, what would you do? What would you do? And, and you guys gave some really interesting answers. But, but the reality is, is, is the, the church we're talking about in Rome, they thought it was close. They thought it was indeed any 
day now. It's a long, long time ago, and they thought at any moment they were going to, in fact, in one of the letters, Paul has to say, you know, get back to work. Don't just hang out and stare up at the sky waiting for Jesus to return, but, but you know, continue on your life and be productive citizens and, and work and provide food for those around you, you know, but and still anticipate the Lord is coming soon. We see this in Romans 13. Romans 13, 11, and 12, would you read this with me? And it says, and do this understanding the present time. The hour has already come for you to wake up from your slumber because our salvation is nearer now than when we first believed. The night is nearly over. The day is almost here. To any day now, any day now. If the church in 56 AD, that's, that's about the time this letter to the Romans was written, about 56, 57 AD. If the church in 56 or 57 AD thought that, that the imminent return of Jesus was going to be really, really soon then, how much more should we do so? There, you're talking about 25, 30 years removed from the time that Jesus is walking on the earth, and they are living with anticipation that Jesus is going to come back. Now, sometimes we look at the times, and, and I know I'm guilty of this, I'll look and say, based on what I read in scripture, we're getting closer, which is a safe bet to say, we're always getting closer. But, but Isaiah, there's some things that need to be checked off on the box of things that Jesus says is gonna come. But those things can happen like that. And at any moment, Jesus could return. And, and the question might be for you this morning is, are you ready for that? Are you ready to meet Jesus? Are you ready, are, are you okay with him? Do you have peace with God that he's offered you? Because God has offered us peace through Jesus Christ. He's taken care of our sins through Jesus, his death on the cross, all our guilt, all our sin paid for on the cross so that we could be completely forgiven and we could have peace with God. And then Jesus rose from the dead so that we could have peace and access to God anytime, anywhere, with anything. Are you there with him? Do you have peace with God? Are you ready to meet Jesus? The church believed it was coming any day, so we should be the exact same. Amen? That's sermon one. My bad. All right? Amen. Sermon two. Time to be awake, alert, and from the ancient Louisiana hillbilly, a growing. <laughs> awake, alert, and a growing. If our hope is in the return of Jesus, shouldn't our life show it? And this is immediately where Paul goes to this church in Rome. And, and the church in Rome sounds like they're doing great things. You know, they have some struggles as they're, they're two different cultures. There's, there's Jewish culture and then there's Gentile culture and they're merging together to worship. So they have battles there. But they're doing some good things. But then he says this, if, if your hope is in the return of Jesus, should your life show it? And this is where we get to hear those things that, that are hard to hear sometimes because they convict us. But as Paul said this, the night is nearly over, the day is almost here. So let us then, this is what he says, let us put aside the deeds of darkness and put on the armor of light. Let us behave decently, as in the daytime, not in carousing and drunkenness, not in sexual immorality and debauchery, not in dissension or in jealousy. Just look at those words for a second and, and see that the root of all sin dwells in, in the hearts, the sinful nature of people. So the temptation to have those, those things going on in our life is present. So we don't just dismiss them because we show up on a Sunday morning. We look at these things and say, is there any present? Because Paul is speaking to a church when he says these very things. So we would be unwise to not take them seriously. Let us behave decently as in the daytime, not in carousing and in drunkenness, not in sexual immorality and debauchery, not in dissension and jealousy. Rather, what does he say? Clothe yourself with the Lord Jesus Christ. And do not think about how to gratify the desires of the sinful nature. Thankfully, we live in a nation where there's no temptations around us and we're not told how to gratify the sinful nature at all. We're told all the time. We're given a myriad of opportunities all the time and those opportunities seem to be increasing over and over again so that it's easier to access sin than ever. But Paul says resist that. Why? Because the day is almost here. Put that stuff off. Rather, clothe yourself with the Lord Jesus Christ. How many of you know what this is? Some of you about my age should know it. It's a Sears Christmas catalog. Do you remember that? The Sears, if you're, if you're, I don't know what age, but if you lived through the 80s, you knew this catalog 
As if you lived through the 80s as a kid, you knew this catalog. I love this catalog. It came in about September, October, and it was our opportunity to look and begin to prepare for Christmas by finding all the things that we didn't know existed that all of a sudden we wanted. And it's amazing how getting this catalog made Christmas seem like it was right around the corner, but yet it also created agony because there was just this introduction of now I have all this want and all this hope, and i got to wait for it. But this Christmas catalog, uh, our parents were very generous with Christmas. And so my brother and I would look through it and find all kinds of things. And of course, he would convince me to circle things that he thought I should circle. And I would circle some things that I wanted. That would be our list. We would begin circling the things that we wanted for Christmas out of this catalog. And it had everything. I remember, you remember the Nintendo? First time I ever heard of the Nintendo Sears Christmas catalog. I didn't know what it was, but I saw it and I said, yeah, we want that. <laughs> right? And I was right. I was right. But then, but then it created this anticipation for Christmas morning. And as we got closer and closer and closer to Christmas morning, if you remember what it's like to be a kid, building up to Christmas, if you had a big Christmas, and, and just to that moment where we got to Christmas Eve, and we would go and we would watch the, the nativity story acted out in front of us. And, and I was so glad that we're there because that meant that Christmas was almost here. We got time to open presents. I didn't care, really. I didn't know what was going on with Jesus and all that. I knew the story a little, but I didn't. That wasn't where my heart was. My heart was back home where the presents were going to be. The anticipation. Now, so here's the reality why we're talking about this. If our hope is in the return of Jesus again, should our life show it? If the church thought in 56, 57 AD, they, they got the catalog and they saw Jesus is coming back. They, they saw and they read it in the Old Testament. They heard the words of Jesus. They heard the words passed down from the angels. They said, well, Jesus is coming back. And you can imagine the anticipation. My question is, is, is there that kind of anticipation for meeting Jesus? I'll, I'll confess sometimes yes, sometimes no. Sometimes I, I just go on with my days, right? But, but this letter says that we should keep that in front of us because it is indeed any day now, and so we need to wake up, and that means we need to confess our sin. If you have sin in your life that you haven't confessed, then don't wait until you meet Jesus to take care of that. You want to take care of that ahead of time. Give that to him. He's, he's paved the way. The door is wide open. You can walk in through the door that is Christ. Confess your sin and then battle temptation. Don't take the delay in him returning as just an opportunity to do whatever you want. I hope that we as a people will live in such a way that the Lord is happy with how we live and delighted in what he sees. Don't you? I want the Lord to be delighted when you meet him because of what you've done with what he's given you. So battle temptation, and then as it says, put on the Lord Jesus Christ. In other words, grow in faith. And I know you guys are here this morning, and I hope that you're here for that reason, that you want to grow in faith. Any day now, so let's be awake, let's be alert, let's get to growing. Okay? Amen? Amen. That's two sermons. Told you. We're, we're, we're doing all right. Anybody, nobody's actually got a stopwatch, do they? We got sermon three. Sermon number three, there, this one, there, there's a reoccurring problem that, that comes up over and over again in Scripture. As we read the, the, the Scripture from the beginning to the very end, especially as we get into the New Testament, we read the letters to the churches, there's a reoccurring problem that shows up in Scripture, and I guarantee that your life has been affected by this problem. You've probably <laughs> lost some sleep over this problem. you probably had uh, a day ruined by this problem. Do you know what this problem is? Anybody want to guess? Well, you've probably dealt with it again and again. Any guesses? Others. You know. Other people. Them. Those guys. Speaking of others, uh, you know, I thought it'd be a good opportunity to deal with, with an other situation. So, you know, I have something that, that's been going on with, with Greg, and, and I kind of want to deal with that. Greg, could you come up here and just like to deal with something with Greg that, that's been kind of going on, and, and we just need to, we kind of hash this out. It seems like a really good time to do that on a Sunday morning in front of everybody, <laughs> right? There's a microphone, Greg, because that way they can hear your, your defense. I, I, I just got to, I got to say, Greg, I saw the other day, um, I was driving through town, and I, I saw you come out of this Chinese food restaurant, and um, they were, it looked like you had ate a ton. Is that, is that, is that accurate? Was, were you actually in there eating? Yeah, you know, I was so thankful. Because the Bible says God is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. 
You helped me diligently seek the Lord, and he rewarded me at the city buffet. The city buffet. <laughs> took all the calories out, and I, you know how beautiful that food is, and uh, salads everywhere, and meat of every other kind you can think of, and desserts. You and went to a Chinese place and got that, salad. They have a football <laughs> game going on, the TV said you can watch. It's like heaven on earth. It's like, really? wow. Did you know that inside that, that restaurant, there's a statue of Buddha, though? A what? Statue of Buddha. <laughs> They see, so you know, it's a, it's a, it's a God, awesome, but, you know, <laughs> and, and food is like some people put money on that statue as an offering to that. So in a way, doesn't it seem like you're maybe uh, what? Um, offering <laughs> praise to Buddha? Okay, well, don't say anything about the Golden Corral then. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> but, but then, also, man, you did not see me coming out of the Greet the Morning Sun yoga studio, did you? I did not. not you greet didn't the see sun. me coming out I did not of the dance that. studio, did but you? But I did see you later on. That same day, coming out of a dance hall. Yeah, well, you and know. And with Sharon, and you, apparently you guys went dancing. Yeah, I was thinking I'm going to two step over heaven, but I got to learn how to do the two step. Right. They never, they but don't teach that. You know, you know that for some reason, the Bible doesn't really say why or talk about it at all, but for some reason, we're probably not supposed to dance. You know that, right? No, I thought the Israelites danced at the Red Sea. Well, yeah, but not in a dance hall. I thought David danced. <laughs> <laughs> that was before the that was before the, the Ark okay. of the Covenant. So um, outside the dance. Outside, place. okay, yeah. <laughs> but but maybe you know I think uh, maybe we just kind of let all that stuff go because you know Greg served as a pastor for 40, 40 years, right? Forty. Yeah. Forty. And, and what was the name of the French church that you pastored at? It was Methodist. <laughs> Get off my stage. You can, <laughs> anyway. <laughs> Thanks, Greg. Thanks, Greg, for all your time. There's a reoccurring problem in Scripture, and that, uh, that problem is other people. There's a reality, right? People tend to group up. I mean, if we're talking about other people. We're not talking about us. People tend to group up with people like themselves, right? And then they tend to judge, sometimes with words, often with actions or thoughts. Those who are not like them. And this shows up in Scripture over and over again. The, the passage of scripture that Alan read this morning during open worship calls to the church, begs them to, to love one another, to consider one another. But there's this reoccurring problem. We see it over and over again. And even in the book of Romans, it's not the first time it's popped up. It's popped up over and over again. Other people, the problem that other people bring to us. Now, you might think that, that Christians wouldn't struggle with, with this issue. But, but again, nearly every letter in the New Testament addresses this very issue of loving other people. Not just loving people outside the church, but loving people inside the church. And if you just take a moment and look around at the people sitting around you, you'll see people that are like you, and you'll see people that are different than you, I hope. Now, now when we're talking about other people, we're talking about the people in this room, we're talking about other people who are Christians that may go to other places and worship there on Sunday mornings. But the Bible takes this issue incredibly serious, and as we're talking about end times, any day now, be awake, be alert, be growing, and then it goes directly into talking about our relationships with one another. And it says it simply this, Romans 14, verse 1, let's read it together. Accept those whose faith is weak without quarreling over disputable matters. And, and at above my Bible, it says this, it's the title for the section, and it says this, do not pass judgment on one another. Very blunt and to the point accept those whose faith is weak. And so sermon number three is accept one another. Again, since it's any day now, we need as many allies in our faith as possible. Because as I read about what is to come before Jesus returns, it does not get easier. It looks like it gets much, much more difficult to the point where even the elect would be deceived. If you don't know what that means, you can look into it later, we can talk about it later, but it's saying that things are going to be more increasingly difficult. I think it is more difficult to live a Christian life, a public, bold Christian life today than maybe it was 50 years ago. Maybe I'm wrong. But it's not going to get easier like this. Now you could go to a remote island and live in a hammock and, and soak up the sun and ignore people the rest of your life, but then you wouldn't be able to fulfill what God has for you to do on this earth. It's any day now we need as many allies in our faith as possible. And I know that to be true for me. 
Did you know it takes about, about one month to make exercise a habit? That's all. Easy enough, right? One month, you can make exercise a habit. How long do you think it takes to change your way of eating and make it a habit to eat a different way? About three months. Three months to change, truly change your diet. Truly change. It's, it's really easy to break that and to go back to your old diet, but it takes about three months to really change your pattern of eating. But did you know that it takes no time at all to nurture a critical spirit? Doesn't that come natural to us? And just because we're here praising the Lord doesn't mean that it doesn't exist in, in somewhere in the corner of our heart or maybe it's very present in your life right now. And you're just being critical of somebody, either they're a Christian or not. Maybe it's a certain type of people. But regardless, nurturing a critical spirit takes no time at all. So what are we supposed to do with others? Because it's a continual problem in Scripture. So what are we supposed to do with others? Well, if they're not a Christian, if they're not a believer, then, then it's pretty clear we're not to be surprised that they sin. It always astonishes me when, when a Christian is surprised that a non-Christian sins. Right? They, 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 they shouldn't surprise you at all. Don't judge as if they should do better. I mean, you have Jesus. And still you battle temptation, correct? How many of you fought temptation this week? Sometime, this, sometime in 2022, you faced temptation just a little bit. And you have Jesus. How many of you probably failed at least once in 2022? Yeah. And you have Jesus. You have the Holy Spirit as a follower of Christ. We shouldn't be surprised if somebody that doesn't have Jesus, that doesn't have the power of the Holy Spirit helping them, convicting them, guiding them, giving them the truth is going to struggle and stumble again and again. So we shouldn't be surprised and we shouldn't judge that. That's not our job. Not our job when it comes to others who are non-believers. What we should do, and this is revolutionary, it's probably never been heard before. Instead, you should share the love of God with them. <laughs> You've probably heard that before, right? Because Jesus calls us to. What are we to do with people who are non-Christians, who are others, who maybe rub us the wrong way or annoy us, whatever they do? Maybe they eat at Chinese food restaurants, <laughs> pastor non-friends churches. What are we to do with them? Well, we're to, we're to love them the way Jesus loved us. God's very clear with that. We have unmerited grace given to us, unmerited love. We don't deserve what's been poured out lavishly, extravagantly upon us. And God asks us to be open to loving others as well. Go, teach, nurture, bless. Do these things. When you see, go to them. Seek them out. Teach them when God gives you an opportunity. Teach them in love. Speak truth, but speak it in love. Do acts of service in love. Be kind in the same way that Christ washed his disciples' feet even when they were about to betray him. So also we should serve those who are around us. We should bless them. Amen. Do this as if their life depended on it. Because it's any day now. I have friends that, that I don't know if they know Jesus yet. And I really, really hope that they do know him before the any day now is today. So we should live in such a way as if their life depends on it. I believe that's what God calls us to do. So what do we do with others when they're believers? And that's really what Romans is getting to. What do we do with, with, with others who are believers and we just struggle with them? Well, I think part one, when you find somebody else who's a believer, part one is Eureka, rejoice, you're not alone. You're not the only Christian on the planet. That's really, really good news because if you're the only Christian on the planet, that's a really heavy load to carry all on your own. You should rejoice when you find another Christian, even if they're weird, because they probably are, and you are too, and that's okay. Rejoice that you found another Christian. You're not alone. It's really, really important that we have one another. Relationship, fellowship, unity are the main things that we need to focus in the main things of faith. So as Greg and I were joking around up here, that was just an illustration to kind of break the ice and introduce this topic. You know that I don't have anything against him. That's not a, that's not a joke. It's true. I don't have anything against Greg. Because in the main things of faith, as Greg and I talk, I hear Jesus and I hear the words of God coming out of his mouth. And so we have relationship and fellowship and unity around the main things of faith. There's some small things that we probably disagree on. That's okay. We should have relationship, we should have fellowship and unity in the main things of faith with every other Christian that we could find that believes in the same Lord and Savior that we do. We should, we should do that and we should not be surprised when a new Christian struggles. Uh, a newborn takes time to learn how to walk, so also a, a person who was born again takes time before they kind of shake off the old life. 
And we shouldn't expect that to happen any sooner than the Holy Spirit empowers. Don't be surprised that a newborn takes time to walk. And don't be surprised that each life is unique. It's good that we're different. Because that way God can put us in so many different areas and reach all different kinds of people. Some of you are called to do things in, in spoken word to teach others about Jesus. Some of you are simply called to serve. Some of you are called to build up other believers so that they can do that. Either way, God is calling us all to love him and to love others as ourselves. So here's the, here's the startling part about others as we begin to wrap this up. I told you, it's 3 and 30. The Bible doesn't tell us how to fix others, and that's pretty hard. It doesn't tell us how to fix people who disagree with us in small matters. Because the Bible is not overly concerned with the small matters. Because they thought any day now meant any day now. They really thought Jesus was coming in their lifetime. And so they didn't worry as much about trying to fix the churches on small matters. They said, let's keep the main thing the main thing. Let us imitate Jesus Christ. Let us follow him and love him and serve him and love one another as best we can. But they had to be reminded again and again and again to love each other. So this is our reminder this morning. We just have about one or two more weeks left in Romans. And as we do that, let's hear that, that, that all the things that God's called us to, that it comes back to loving one another. The Bible does say to be considerate and don't trip each other up when it comes to small matters. So if there's something that you, and, and say, say you, you follow and you've been part of the French church all your life and, and you have a long discussion with somebody who's been a part of a Baptist church, you can definitely find things that you disagree on that are small. But you can also find the same Lord Jesus that you can praise together and you can pray to together. So we are called to, to love one another. Really, the sermon three is simply this, accept one another. And as I was thinking about this and praying about this, the Lord just said this, all the best things in God's kingdom require time. And they all require a relationship. I'm grateful for my dad. It's, it's hard today being Father's Day and not having him. Because I know we love that silly video. Uh, and Jessica has had a card for Rich, and it's, it was just funny, and it was something I could have given my dad. And I miss that. But I love that dad would take time <coughs> to speak to people, and, and as he got older, he got better at it, about Jesus. And, and my dad wasn't perfect, we all know that. They take time to share Jesus with others, and just to try to be Jesus as best as he could. And that gives us that scripture that we're going to here at the end here in, in Romans 13. And would we read it together? Let no debt remain outstanding except the continuing debt to love one another. For whoever loves others has fulfilled the law. The commandments, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not murder, you shall not steal, you shall not covet. And whatever other commandment there may be are summed up in this one command. Love your neighbor as yourself. Love does no harm. To its neighbor. Mm. Just take a moment, look at somebody around you, and tell them, I'm going to try to love you like the Bible tells me to. <laughs> you don't have to do that. <laughs> Would you take a moment and think about the person that God convicts you of that you're struggling to love? That you need to lay aside some other things, you need to find unity around the main things, and build them up in their faith? We've been seeing this prophecy come up, this one thing that I, that I continue to remind us of is when Jesus talks about the end times getting closer and closer, he says this, because of the increase of wickedness, the love of most will grow cold. Not today, friends. Not here. We're going to choose to love each other. We're going to choose to move towards each other. We're going to choose to put aside each other. And there's, the cool thing is, is you want to preach this message when there's no major rift. And as far as I know, there's no major rift going on. If there is, I am. I'm gone. I have no idea. <laughs> you want to preach this before those kind of things happen, right? To so begin taking steps towards each other. To begin building those bridges towards each other to love one another. Because again, friends, it's any day now. So let us be awake. Let us be alert. Let us get to growing. And let us accept one another. Fully accept one another. And may we delight in God as we try to follow. May we delight God in the way that we try to follow Jesus. And we delight God in the way that we try to follow Jesus. And, and let's do that. Let's pray and, and let's look at this scripture. And let's, let's pray and then and just allow the Lord to lead us into that time. So Abba Father, I thank you for everything you are and everything you've done. But I especially want to thank you for your patience with me. Amen? Amen. Yeah. I'm reminded today that Jesus could return at any moment. 
And I want to be ready for that moment. Amen. And I want to help others to be ready for that moment too. So Father, I confess that I give it. I, I give in to a, a critical spirit when it comes to other people sometimes. I know this does not please you, and I'm sorry. Grow in me the fruit of love, of patience, kindness, goodness towards others. May your church be strengthened in fellowship of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen.